Bishop Laverty, welcome. To our panelists, we've received a number of questions throughout the morning, overheard questions in the hallway, and it's now our chance to really um, go deeper in what we've heard today. Bishop Laverty, I'd love to start with you. Um, our participants have a copy of your letter, Go Forth With Hearts on Fire. And on page 20, you have just a beautiful passage I'd like to read and lead into a question. You said that um, I share with you a very personal experience of Christ which occurred just several years ago, decades into my life as a priest and bishop. Without a doubt, I understood, accepted, and experienced in many ways the love of Christ for me precisely as a disciple, priest, and bishop. However, there was always a kind of glass wall in terms of experiencing his love. It was as if I could see him through the wall, and he could presumably see me, but I did not experience his love to the depth that I so desired. That was not his fault, but mine somehow. Then during a silent eight-day retreat with a group of fellow bishops, the retreat director suggested I bring these passages from Isaiah before the Lord in prayer. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. Fear not, I am with you. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. And it was during prayer with these texts that the Lord allowed this glass wall to suddenly and unexpectedly shatter. I cannot express in words how profoundly I was touched. Bishop Laverty, how can others have this kind of experience? Well, thank you, Soren, for, uh, first of all, for um, opening up that, uh, that vista. Uh, as Soren knows, I was very reluctant to put that story in the pastoral letter because I'm no one special. I'm just an ordinary person, and I certainly don't like to think that somehow we have here some extraordinary person. That, um, but I could see Soren's point that sharing that would also encourage people. Um, how could people have, I, I don't know how everyone could have the same experience, we're all going to have a different experience. Uh, but for me, it's a matter of just saying to the Lord, as I did and still do, uh, you know, Lord, you know I love you, but I don't love you enough yet, and I can't do that without you giving me love to love you back. And uh, I kept saying that, and I, yeah, I felt like that wall, and all of a sudden, that moment, you know, was such a great gift. Uh, and I just think we just have to just be for the Lord and just say, I, I want to love you. Uh, sometimes, Lord, I, I don't do that well. I do have to say, I'm sorry, but I want to. And just as you parents know, how can you, how could a parent not respond to the plea of a son or daughter? And uh, he does, in, in a way, that he wants for each of us. So whether you have that experience per se or a different one, just trust him. He will, he loves us already, and there are moments when he'll make that very, very clear. Thank, Thank you. you for giving me that opportunity to share. Another question which has come up uh, throughout the day is why the church? Why can't I have a personal walk and relationship with Christ without the church. Um, Jennifer, I was wondering if you might lead us off in, in kind of how you've grappled with that question and then if our other speakers might. Right. Um, to me, that question was pretty clear after my debacle of trying to read the Bible by myself and, and interpret it by myself. What I saw pretty clearly is, you know, with the question is, how can we, why can't we have a personal walk with Jesus without the church. I think the question worth drilling down on there is, which Jesus? Are you sure you have the correct knowledge of who the person of Jesus Christ is? Because I, I know many well-meaning people who are, are trying to love the Lord and, you know, maybe they're part of a, like a, I, I have a friend who's part of a, a Unitarian church and, and she really wants to love the Lord. She has a very different idea of Jesus. Than, than I do. And so for me, it was very clear that Christ would have left us with one church that he instills with his own authority and that, that he guides to this day. 
for many reasons, but for one of them, so that we can simply ask, sim that, so that we can simply get the answer to the question, who is Jesus Christ? Mm. Father Zout? I, I would bring out a point that I made in my talk this morning about obedience. Um, and this is quite an unpopular word in American society. Um, <laughs> right. The bishop agrees. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, St. Benedict says about obedience, um, <clears throat> well, well, we learned that the root, cause, the, root, the root of the word obedience is obider, which means to listen. And the first words of St. Benedict's rule is, is listen, my son. And therefore, the church gives us actually a, a most venerable authority, 2,000 years old with with the most extensive wisdom of any organization in the world, spiritual wisdom, um, uh, practical wisdom, uh, earthly wisdom, uh, intellectual wisdom, the wisdom of the saints, uh, the wisdom of scriptures. It, so this wise authority is an authority for us to obey. Now, the reason um, St. Benedict says this is important is because when we learn to obey, even a little bit, our will begins to be conformed to the will and the purpose of something much greater than us. First of all, the church, and our, our, uh, but also through, through the church, God himself. And so when we learn to obey uh, in a human sphere, we will then learn to be able to obey and respond to God's call when it comes. And without anything to obey, without any uh, organization to obey, without any teaching to obey, we don't have that. We're just making it up as we go along. We're just skidding along on the surface of life, uh, responding to our own whims and instincts. Um, so I would say we need the church because we need uh, this loving uh, Father's authority in order to learn to obey. And when we learn to obey, we hitch our will with God's will, and when that happens, with God, nothing is impossible. Revelation. And I'd like to uh, compliment both both uh, views uh, with uh, this third one from a different perspective. And that is, the question we ought to ask is, how does God want us to relate to him? How has he made that clear to us? And if you look into the pages of both Old and New Testament, you see God has always dwelt with a community of people. Yes, very personal. Each person has a relationship with the Lord, but it's never in isolation. It's with a community, as it was with Israel and as it now is with the new Israel, the church. And Christ himself is very clear that he formed this community and then through the inspiration given by the Holy Spirit to St. Paul, we've learned that the, the image of the church is a living mystical body and you can't separate head from members so we can't separate Christ from his church that's not something the church made up it's how God wants us to relate in a very personal way relationship but always within a community and so for me uh, in addition to the wonderful responses that both father and Jennifer gave I'd add that one too how does God want us to relate to him or to relate to his beloved son? Not in isolation. Yes, very personal, but within a community as the community of his disciples where we find support and strength. You know, uh, a question that um, has really been on some people's hearts is the question of hypocrisy. Um, you know, look, I, I want to make this step, you know, here we are talking about risk and taking a step towards Christ, but I just look at the church or I look at, I look at other Christians and I don't see lives matching with what they're professing. Uh, I wonder if our panelists could talk about, uh, you know, what might you advise someone like that who's just kind of wrestling with that, um, kind of would like to go deeper, but is kind of stuck on hypocrisy and disillusionment. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody already knows the old story of um, the guy who said to the priest, I don't want to come into church, you know, it's all full of hypocrites. And the priest said, if you wanted to come anyway, we can always make room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> 
And I mean, that sums it up. Uh, and in fact, when people look around and say, I don't see any real Christians, you know, and so forth, I want to turn around and say, you know, I've looked around and I've seen a lot. Um, and uh, the ordinary people, very simply, living out their lives as followers of Jesus Christ in their own simple way. And when people say that they have, don't see any, I want to say, maybe it's a developed, maybe it's an acquired taste, and you haven't actually learned how to find them yet. Mm. Other responses on, on that? Well, I think the question is very real. Uh, we all hear it, mm -hmm. and um, I think one of the things is to remember is, first of all, the church is, is, has two sides. Has Christ had two natures? Christ had a divine nature and a human nature. And that was a stumbling block for people. Uh, either one of those different, different, different people. And so with the church, the church is made up of human beings. I don't know any perfect human being. Sorry, I don't want to insult you. But <laughs> I don't know any <laughs> perfect human being. Um, and um, I'm the first to admit I'm not perfect. You ask the people who live with me, they will acknowledge that. Um, so you have imperfect human beings who therefore will not always be living the ideal we want. Isn't that the problem sometimes with marriage, I think, in today? We expect the spouse to be perfect. If you're not perfect, I won't love you anymore. Really? Isn't that interesting? Well, I guess I don't see you perfect either. But anyway, we'll let that one go. But, <laughs> but I think that's part of it, and I think we have to acknowledge, yes, there are imperfections in human beings who make up the church, and they can disappoint us if we want to focus on that. But as, as both our speakers have also said, there are many wonderful people who, who try. It's not a matter of being perfect, it's a matter of being faithful, what Brother, what the brother Peter said. Yeah. So it seems to be when people say, well, you know, they're all you hypocrites. You're right, you know, draw it up because we need one more. But, <laughs> but you know, we're all imperfect and I think we need to get beyond that and acknowledge something else. In the church there is also a divine element. What other human entity, what other entity could have survived 2,000 years of inner corruption and outside opposition if it didn't have a divine element? In the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So we'll bump along together. <laughs> um question for all of our panelists, but maybe Jennifer, if you could kick us off. In your memoir, you described such a beautiful and moving relationship with your own father. Uh, you spoke about it this morning in, in your talk and how he encouraged you to, you know, be a very honest thinker. Um, I wonder what you might say to those who might not have a positive relationship with a father or mother or parents and how that, uh, what's your advice to them? Because it seems that in your own uh, journey of faith, your father's relationship and positive relationship was such a uh, help to you. Uh, now, do you mean not have a positive relationship because they have a different faith or just generally? Not just generally, it? yeah. But, you know, I, I think that that is um, an incredibly difficult cross. If you if you have had either, maybe your parents have passed or, or you're, you're just not able to speak to them. I, I think it is a very heavy, heavy cross. And, and one of the things, um, I, was, I actually went to therapy a while back. I'd, I was first on the scene of a, of a very bad accident. And, um, and I decided to work through that with a therapist. And I, and I told this therapist, I said, you know, I, I, want to, um, I want to explain to people who read my blog or, you know, what is the place of therapy in the Christian life? Because th this was a faithful Catholic therapist at, at a Catholic therapy center. And I said, you know, is it, can't we just pray? I mean, do Catholics don't go to therapy, right? And the example she gave actually reminds me of your question. She said, you know, for example, I, I have a few clients who um, had a very bad relationship with their father. Maybe he was abusive. Maybe he left. And that impacts their ability to relate to God because of the hurt in that 
relationship. She, she said, you know, there's a difference between what we know is true and what we feel is true. And, and she said, you know, I see some of my clients will come in and say, yep, yep, I know that God is my father and he loves me. And she'll say, do you feel that's true? And they'll just start weeping. And so I, I think it's, that's a terrible wound if you have had something happen with your relationship with either parent. And, and I think I might say, you know, if you feel that impact in your spiritual life, if you feel yourself pulling back from God, maybe because of hurts in your own life, try to find a, a faithful Catholic therapist. I, I think there's actually a site called catholictherapist.com. And, and don't be afraid of working through those things with a, a therapist because it, that therapy can absolutely be perfectly complementary to the spiritual life. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would add a couple practical points. Um, first of all, within the community of the church, God may have a, another father or mother out there to help you. Uh, and if you're in that situation, ask. Uh, spend a time in retreat or a time of prayer and fasting and, and then say to the Lord, Lord, please send me that father or that mother. And it, it, it'll be amazing how God will bring someone into your life who actually begins uh, through his providence to fulfill some of the gaps that may be in your emotional and spiritual relational life, um, serving, if you like, as a substitute father or mother, but in a very beautiful, natural way. I've seen this in, in many people's lives. Uh, the second thing to, to, to remind ourselves of is that God has planted in our hearts uh, the longing for a mother's and a father's totally perfect, unconditional love because ultimately we will find that love in the love of our heavenly father and i believe through his uh, providence in the in the love and the protection of the blessed mother um, the blessed virgin mary and that therefore the two predominant prayers in our catholic life is the our father and the hail mary <laughs> and so in this beautiful way if we allow these two prayers just very simple prayers to penetrate into our hearts and lives we will find that um, our relationship with god the father and with the Blessed Mother, will also just very quietly at a deep level begin to minister to those needs in our life. Bishop Laverde, in, Thank you. in your pastoral letter, you speak about a beautiful relationship with your mother and father. I wonder if you might have anything to add. Well, I, get I was blessed, certainly, in, in that way. Um, but, you know, I've been a priest for almost 49 years now, and I've dealt with people who I know have had very painful relationships with mom or dad or both. And therefore, at that level, it's very hard for them to relate. It's easy for me, it's hard for them. But I think the advice we've gotten here, certainly, Father, is very beautiful. The two, the two dominant prayers, particularly these two dominant um, uh, re realities in our faith. And sometimes people do need therapy, as you pointed out or a good spiritual director to work through um, what often is called the father wound. Um, so I, these are ways, and, and to know that even to say to the Lord, I think even, it's hard for me to relate to you as father, or, but I know you love me, and so, as Father said, send me someone to make that love real. And with the help of Our Lady, that, that'll, become, that'll become better. Not immediately, but better. A question for our panel, for, for anyone who'd like to take this. Um, what does joy look like? You know, we're, we're in a kind of cynical age, a cynical age. Uh, irony is kind of prized. Well, we hear the word joy. It, you know, what does that look like in your own life, or how do you explain that? All right, the, the person with six kids, I'll take it. <laughs> and we live in a three-bedroom house, and it's, oh boy, what is joy. joy? Yeah, what does joy look like? I, it, it's funny, it's, it's hard to explain. I was on an interview the other day where I talked about, you know, we used to live downtown and drive a Jaguar and take first-class flights wherever we want, and I said, you know, now we're broke and all eight of us are crowded into this house and we have trouble paying the bills and the kids just scream all the time. But, oh gosh, I'm so glad I'm on, on this path. It was a little hard for them to understand, like, so this is better, you know, the new, the new path. 
I think here's the quote that comes to mind when I when I meditate on like what does this joy look like? Is this I, I there was this guy who was he ran the biggest atheist website in the world at the time, vitriolic, angry, angry atheist. He converted to Catholicism through his work in the pro life movement. And he wrote his conversion story, and the line that jumped out to me is that he said the more he got involved in the pro-life movement and the more he got involved in Catholicism, he said, suddenly, I was surrounded by life, mm. just through his parish community, through his friends. The, his, 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 his life was filled with the lives of other people. And something that had never really occurred to me in my secular lifestyle, which is very isolating, it's a very me-centered isolating lifestyle is, you know, love can only come through other people. You know, the, the nice hotel room in Tahiti, I mean, there's, there's no love there unless there are other people there. And so, yes, it's noisy. And yes, my kids seem to have like a genetic predisposition to just screaming all the time. Like, I'm an only child and my husband's an only child. So <laughs> we, we, look, we look at each other and we're like, what is this life? <laughs> but, but our house, by virtue of being filled with life, it is filled with love and therefore filled with joy. So that, that is what joy looks like in our house. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jensen. Uh, I would echo that very briefly. I was trying to think of experience of joy and <clears throat> by most... Um, profound memory of encountering joy in a very raw state was meeting Mother Teresa in Calcutta uh, and meeting her and then visiting the home for the dying and uh, the mother house uh, and actually son, realizing that when I saw here, them, uh, I saw joy incarnate. So I would say joy is the fruit of self-sacrifice. Thank you. Thanks, Father. Thanks. Yes, and I think joy is... Uh, to be distinguished from being happy. Not that I say we should not be happy, but happiness really is the byproduct of, of being, of doing what is right and good. It's never a goal, it's a byproduct. Uh, and joy, I think, sometimes is misunderstood, particularly in our cynical society. It doesn't always mean you were skipping around, dancing, and all of that, though it can. A joy really is an, it comes from an inner peace. That, that, and that inner peace comes from the Lord. When we're doing what he asks, even when it's difficult, and sometimes it can be very difficult, as we heard from our, our presenters, nevertheless, at a deeper level, there is, there's a, an inner peace. And they, that's the kind of joy that's also reflected in, in the way people interact. You spoke about this wonderful lady, Drew, does it, you know, in your life. And I, I would think she was a person of joy. Uh, she may not have always been rah rah, but but just being with her, you knew that there was an inner inner peace and joy, and I think that's the joy we're really seeking and that we want to diffuse. And of course, it should come across in, in tangible ways, and often does. I mean, our Holy Father just wrote that beautiful exhortation, the joy of the gospel, and if anyone. I mean, uh, his visible side of joy, it's himself, when you see how he, you know, but, but that doesn't come just from some kind of, super, it comes from, it's not superficial with him, it comes from, a, I think, a deep, deep union with the Lord. So I think that's the joy we're seeking and that we want to, you know, it's, it, it comes from inside out. A question for uh, any of our panelists, but you know, we've heard such striking stories of kind of before and after with Father Dwight Longenecker, with Jennifer Fulweiler. Um, you know, what do you, what do you say to those who might, might be in the room and look back on kind of a, an upbringing in the faith that doesn't seem to have these dramatic before and after moments? Uh, it seems kind of quiet. It seems kind of, um, you know, they, you know, they don't see those landmarks how would they be able to share their own faith in a way uh, when you don't kind of look back on this dramatic conversion from atheism to, to the Catholic faith? Yeah, I, I want to emphasize the importance of this because <clears throat> 
I believe if we're living the life of faith, we're going on this adventure of faith, we will have experiences that we can share with people, but they can be all the more powerful because they're not big and dramatic, because they're very ordinary. Uh, and when they're very ordinary, they speak that much more to other people who have very ordinary lives. Um, and they don't actually have to be great, wonderful miracle stories about how you saw an angel or something. Um, I mean, if you do see angels, lovely, that's great. But, um, <laughs> and remember, they're a good Catholic therapist. No. No. <laughs> uh, what, what I mean, seriously, what I mean is that when you share those very ordinary stories with people, uh, that encourages them. And, it, and even if the story is one of doubt and difficulty, um, when you didn't succeed, that too is sharing the faith story. Remember the story of Peter, uh, who <clears throat> denied the Lord, uh, who stumbled and fell many times. But that was also part of the story. So uh, don't be, be, be afraid to share just the ordinary things and the successes, the failures, um, the doubts, and the difficulties as well as, as the triumphs. Could I uh, just yes, make a please. comment? Um, I, I'm enthralled and, and grateful to God for the wonderful way in which you, each of you have experienced his loving care and providence. Um, I grew up I was going to say, in an easy way. I, by that I mean is, I have no dramatic stories of conversion in that sense in my life. Um, I always wanted to be a priest. I can't even say that has, has sometimes happened. So there are men and women who've been called by the Lord, and for years they keep running away from him, and finally, you know, they, <laughs> they say, Lord, I, I can't run anymore. Um, I don't have that story either, you know. It's, it's kind of a kind of a simple way, I mean, and sometimes I used to think, well, I don't know, I don't have these dramatic moments. Now, we did have the, 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 the walls, the glass wall, but that was much later in my life. Um, but maybe, as I reflect, though, um, I could share the life of faith, though, not in that dramatic way, but just in the, in the way I have known all my life that God has been with me and directing me even when I didn't know it or realize it or had other plans. That God has been with me when I've sinned. You know, and some, you know many of you hear me say all the time, pray for me. I, I say that it's a bit of a, um, uh, with great sincerity. But I say, well, I don't, I, maybe all the other bishops don't, any, don't need prayers. I mean, they probably all are saints. But... I know one bishop who does need prayers, <laughs> and you're looking at him, so you can pray for me. Um, but I say that sincerely because, you know, as I say to people, you know, I go to confession too. You do? Yeah, I do. I go regularly, you know. Now, I'm not going to tell you my sins because those are private. But, but I mean, um, I, I think the, the wonder of, of, of a story of faith could be just the marvelous, continual, abiding care of the Lord, even when an individual like myself forgot it, ignored it, said, no, he's never given up. And um, I think that too could be a quiet witness um, of, how, of how wonderful he is. Even when, as they say, when we don't sense that. And he can often seem absent. I mean, we all have that experience sometimes. Yeah, where are you? Where are you? I don't see you, don't feel you. No. That's probably the most, the moment we closest. But you know the, the thing with the, the footsteps in the sand, I love that. But anyway, I've talked too much, the next question. <laughs> oh, you can go on, Bishop. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for about two more questions. Uh, what about the life of prayer? I wonder if each of our panelists might speak about just how to get started. Jennifer, you had this incredible story of uh, actually saying, okay, are you there? I'm, um, I'm gonna try this. Um, how do you get started? How do you um, renew the life of prayer? What's your, how would you kind of begin Uh, I have found um, 
increasingly that, uh, and even from the beginning, that there's a balance between uh, informal conversation with the, the Lord, um, talking to that invisible person you were talking about, um, but also the structured life of prayer with the divine office. And of course, priests uh, are required and deacons are required to say the divine office every day, um, a certain number of offices. But the offices, of course, are available for lay people too through Magnificat and through a shortened version of, of the divine office so that there should be this formal structure to the prayer life um, as well as the informal. Uh, our Holy Father, St. Benedict, says that prayer should be short and, f and from the heart. Uh, in other words, and yet he was speaking from a position of the monastic life of prayer, which was very structured and very formal. So there's this interplay between the two, and both are necessary. I'm reminded of something which <clears throat> one of the Anglican archbishops of Canterbury said, and they said to him, a journalist said to him, um, uh, Archbishop, how long do you pray? He said, two minutes, but it takes me 25 minutes to get there. In other words, he was using formal prayer and the divine office as the structure which led him into that place which was beyond words, which was his two minutes of com communion with God. Yeah, and I think, too, uh, um, every one of us is probably at a different s spot in terms of how prayer in involves, how we are involved with the Lord through prayer. But I think we need to, if we haven't begun yet, or haven't begun intentionally, you know, sometimes we, we do things by rote. You know, we go to church, yeah, we're there. And sometimes, unfortunately, we leave and we think, hmm, I don't remember much. Uh, I don't even know what he said. <laughs> you know how it is it can be. My point would be that we begin slowly. How about, you know, in the morning when we first wake up, do we offer the, the day to God? Every part of it. It's a beautiful way to begin the day. It doesn't take a long time uh, to, to make one's morning offering. Whether we use the beautiful words that, that the church gives us in several forms or our own. Um, and a quick, it, and then a, a salutation to Our Lady. And, and then, you know, do we pray at, at meals? What happened to that? Be grateful for the food. Uh, and at night before we go to bed, do we, do we, do we thank God for the good things? Do we ask his help? Uh, do we say, I'm sorry, and I need to begin again tomorrow? Um, do husbands and wives pray together? I often think about that. You know, uh, you share so much of life. Do you share prayer? A beautiful image of a husband and wife holding their hands at night saying a, a prayer together. Beautiful. In my, in my soul, I've been thinking that's beautiful. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know... It, it, you can't start, well, I'm going to pray an hour today. Well, if you haven't prayed two minutes or five minutes, you're going to find an hour difficult. So start small, but let the Lord lead you. Do we take a few minutes with the word of God? You know, the, God's word is so rich and powerful and instructive and nourishing. It's not an historical, it's, it's, it's a living word. But again, small, start small. And notice if we're really open, the Lord just leads us closer. And then, of course, that's, that's kind of informal, that's kind of personal. And there's always liturgical prayer. You know, there's, and it must be. You know, the prayer, the prayer of the Mass and the prayer of the other sacraments. And in many places, as Father alluded to, the, the, the prayer of the divine office. Many parishes now need to do that. Prayer, prayer is our breath. When we pray, we're really breathing. We're really, we're being open to let the Lord in us and work in us. Um, but begin slowly and see where that takes you. You'd be surprised. I would just add that if you are surrounded by chaos, as I am, it's easy to just be so overwhelmed that even when you carve out time to pray, you end up just thinking about your to-do list and looking around like, have I still not put that laundry away? Like, oh, man. <laughs> I have found that if you need to kickstart your prayer life, there's no substitute for getting out of your house, out of your office, and getting in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. That's usually what I do when I just feel like I'm in a rut and I haven't said a real prayer in days or even weeks sometimes. 
we uh, were blessed to have perpetual adoration at my parish, but even before we did, I would just go down to the chapel and sit in front of the tabernacle, and every time I find that it's, it gives me that kind of fresh kickstart that I needed. Uh, uh, just a brief question in closing. What next? For someone who's here today and who just uh, sensed their heart uh, being moved in some way, um, of course we saw in the Pope uh, Francis quote on the posters and the flyers that the Lord uh, does not disappoint those who take a risk, uh, who take a step closer to Christ. Uh, just briefly, I know everyone is unique and individual, but if, if you just had a, a word for where to go from here. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for them. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, first of all, I can't tell you how how much my heart rejoices at seeing all of you here. What a great, great. No, it's a it's a tribute to you because it means each of you, wherever you are. I, I'm sure people are here at every stage of of a relationship or maybe no relationship with the Lord. But something, well, it, wasn't, it was someone who moved you. You know, we, we're here because ultimately the Lord led us. He, you know, he didn't force us, but he led us. Um, but first of all, I'm just so pleased that you are here. And, and I want you to know that the church is a family. And we're not perfect. You are any perfect families? I don't. But we're a family. And yeah, we need one another, and we miss those among us who no longer practice for whatever reason, and there are many reasons. And, you know, I, I just want to say, come home. The family waits. I wait with longing for you to come back home. Yeah, forgive us the times we've not acted well, but, you know, we're all human. Let's stumble along together because we miss you. And if you don't have yet a family, there's one to be found. We ain't perfect, but we're God's and he loves us. And come and find Jesus in the community that he founded. Risk it. In the end, it's more than worthwhile you'll discover that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would follow on from that and, and uh, as a next step, I would encourage people to remember the uh, points I made in my second talk about our comfort zone, uh, the call, questioning the call, equipping the call, uh, and uh, then the crisis, and just take time to pray through that and ask the Lord, Lord, where am I in these in these in these five stages? Where am I, and what do you want me to do? Uh, lead me and show me, and He will show you. But um, it's one of those things about be careful what you you pray for because you might get it. Um, and so I encourage you to t to risk, take the risk of of Jesus, and uh, ask Him those questions, and then respond uh, and step out on that journey. That I, I would just add that um, obviously I know how scary that is. If you might feel like you're you're at this you know fork in the road and you're not sure which way to go, and it's because it is scary. And like I said, I mean this this belief system, living this life and putting God first and putting the church first, it only really works if God is actually real. It is a risk. It is scary. But, you know, they say that God can't be outdone in generosity, and it's true in this area of life, too. I promise that if you give him your life, the more you make these sacrifices to follow him and to put him at the center of your life, I promise you that he will repay you in peace and in joy. Join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.